uh, it's three minutes uh, over time in that sense. So, so let's let's just get started. So, so it's my great pleasure to in, uh, introduce uh, Davide Cirillo. I hope hope I pronounced it more or less correctly. And um, I met I met uh, uh, David uh, um, during my short stay at uh, the Supercomputing Institute in Barcelona, BSc, where he um, holds uh, a position, a group leader position um, for machine learning methods um, regarding precision medicine and, and of rare diseases and pediatric cancers, that's how one pronounces it, right? And so what, what I really um, found interesting that a lot of uh, the, the machine learning techniques he's using overlaps with things we're doing here as well. And um, I mean, beyond the computational challenges also David addresses, um, he's also doing research in, in the direction of the ethic problems occurring using artificial intelligence, which is somehow something, a topic here in, in, in Casos, we also want to, to go further with that. So overall, I would say there are a lot of things which, which overlap and could be interesting for, for many uh, here of us. And I got the mail that Artur will join in a minute. And uh, with that, I would say it's my great pleasure and I, I hand over to David. Please, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Michael, for the introduction and uh, thank you all for, for being here and for giving me the space to present uh, our work. So um, yes, there are many things I, I, I wanted to talk, I had to kind of select, but still those are a lot. So, and I will present a, a lot of information. So if there is some doubts, you can interrupt me, interrupt me at any time uh, if you miss something or if you want to ask. So don't uh, don't be shy. Um, okay. So first of all, I would just like spend two uh, a couple of words about the Barcelona Supercomputing Center because this can be interesting for you if you are looking for um, computational resources that you want to use in your uh, in your projects. So uh, the uh, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center is the national center of supercomputation in uh, in Spain. We have four different departments, and this is a research institute. So, uh, which means that we are open uh, to, you know, share our uh, our uh, resources, computational resources, with the rest of uh, uh, of Europe, in particular. Uh, indeed, the, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center hosts the uh, Mare Nostrum 4, which is uh, uh, currently one of the most powerful supercomputer in Europe, with a total peak performance of almost 14 petaflops uh, per second. This is like trillions of operations per second. And we are currently installing the Marianostrum 5, which is going to increase even more this, uh, um, uh, this uh, computational capacity. So the, the interesting thing for you is uh, those two uh, links here. So the Marianostrum uh, is part of uh, a network of supercomputers in Europe, which is called RACE, and a network of supercomputers in Spain, which is called RES. So uh, every three or four months, they, uh, they have, you know, you can apply with uh, a project in order to ask for computational hours. And this is highly recommended because it's super easy to get uh, computational hours for your project. It's super simple because it's like a couple of pages. And, uh, and the more ambitious you are, the better. So like the, you can really use this uh, supercomputer for your own research. And this is what we want uh, also um, from, from Barcelona. So uh, feel free to, to check out uh, Trace and Res. OK, so now we can start with, uh, with the presentation. So um, I wanted to give you like an overview of the type of work that we do in, uh, in the lab, uh, uh, covering like different scales. Uh, with different uh, uh, use cases, with different uh, um, with different uh, um, uh, studies. So we go from uh, molecular level. Uh, for instance, I will uh, talk about interactions at the level of the chromatin. From the cellular level, we will talk about single cell transcriptomics in COVID, uh, and then uh, what happens when we want to have a more holistic uh, uh, view of systems right, by integrating different types of information. And then even we will reach, uh, if there is time, the population level. So, um, uh, and we will talk about uh, mobility and the incidence in COVID. So uh, as you can see, like those are very different and uh, disparate uh, uh, use cases, but those in reality are like they have a, a commonality. So in each one of those uh, of those uh, uh, studies, we always use some kind of network uh, uh, approach, some kind of graph based approach uh, that can be, for instance, based on some rules from experts, uh, based on topological representation, multi-layer networks, or even uh, uh, network embeddings of different types. 
So uh, this is a bit, the, let's say, the narrative, a bit the line of the of the presentation. So let's start from the simplest one. So if you have, like, you know, someone that knows something about the system that you are analyzing and you want to create a graph representation of your data, and I will take the case of uh, prostate cancer and in particular the contacts in the chromatin. So just a bit of a refresher on how uh, the genome and how DNA is organizing the nucleus of the cells. Basically, DNA is wrapped around proteins that are called histone, and this uh, uh, object here is called a nucleosome and represents the units of uh, a fiber of DNA and proteins that is called chromatin. So this chromatin is uh, uh, creates uh, loops, and those loops all together essentially are the, the, the body of the chromosomes that we are used to see in biology textbooks, textbooks right? So the interesting thing is that those loops are not random because those loops are created in order to put into contact uh, regions that in the linear genome are distant. So when they are together, they can uh, regulate the transcription. So they can regulate the expression of the genes. What is actually happening uh, oftentimes is something like this. In one hand, you have a promoter, which is the head of a gene, the, the head of the body of a gene. And then uh, this is put in contact with another region, another distal, distal, distal region in the genome, which is called enhancers. And there are uh, proteins that are sitting in this region and sitting in this other region, and they go together in contact, and this regulates the transcription of whatever gene you have here. The problem is that the, the proteins that are there, they are not known. There are some that are known because they are always found in this kind of loops, like for instance, one is called CTCF. But for the rest, what is really happening in terms of interaction between proteins in those loops, it's, it's really not well known because experimentally it's very difficult to, uh, to obtain this information. So what we have to do in order to, to create, like to reconstruct this is to, like take pieces like in a mosaic. So we have uh, some experiments, uh, like for instance, this technique is called high chip. And this is an experiment that really tells you what are the contacts between different regions of, uh, of the genome. So we can have uh, like, for instance, you know, the, the contact between the promoter of a gene and an enhancer. Then you can have contact with other regions uh, uh, of the genome, but uh, this chemical um, this chemical modification here is telling you basically where you have to focus on because here um, uh, this is like really related to some biological pro process like transcription. And this is one piece. Then another piece is. Uh, those proteins need to attach somehow to the to the DNA and and so there are databases that collects binding motifs so uh, for specific proteins so the proteins that are generally prone to to bind dna they recognize uh, specific sequences of nucleotides and those are called motifs and so there are databases that contains this information so this is another piece of information that we can use and then we have a third piece of information that is basically okay this protein what, what are the what are its interactors so this protein is interacting with someone else in prostate, for instance, we are using, we are studying prostate cancer. So with those three pieces, essentially, we created this workflow that we called Penguin, which stands for Promoter and Answer Guided Interaction Network. Here you have the numbers of things that we retrieve, but essentially the way it works is like this. So from this high chip experiment, we have the promoter and enhancer contacts. Then we can uh, map these uh, motifs onto those regions, retrieve the proteins that are prone to bind those the, those motifs and then uh, from the a big network of interaction protein interaction in prostate we can select the ones that the, the intermediates let's say the intermediate proteins that bridges a promoter with an enhancer we reconstructed a total of uh, uh, around four uh, thousand promoter centered uh, networks of this kind and why i call them rule based because the, the, the overall uh, uh, interaction network of prostate is uh, huge. So one protein, it has many different interactors. So we need some rules in order to um, prioritize the proteins that are in between a promoter and an answer and that are interesting for us. So we prioritize based on the expression data. So we can use also RNA-seq data in, uh, in this cancer because we want, of course, that those proteins are expressed, that those are there. Uh, we set a maximum uh, um, um, a maximum path from a promoter to an enhancer of four hopes, 
And this is because we want something that is small and something that is very, uh, let's say, concentrated. And uh, also because there is not much space in, in this uh, between those two uh, regions. And, uh, and then we wanted to prioritize uh, uh, nodes that are central in these subnetworks compared to the big networks of uh, general uh, prostate cancer interactions. And we prioritize these basically using uh, uh, between the centrality and degree. So essentially the, the number of the shortest paths that pass through uh, uh, um, a node and the, the number of uh, uh, the degree. So the number of interactors that this node has. Like with this, essentially, uh, we created those networks, those actually sub networks. Those are 4,000 small networks. And what we did was to cluster them based on the composition of the ages. And here you have the uh, hierarchical uh, uh, clustering of, uh, of those uh, networks based on edge composition and its representation as a dendrogram. You can see that uh, essentially those clusters in eight different clusters. And now the interesting thing is that, okay, now I know that like uh, those contacts in the chromatin, they share similarities in terms of those uh, proteins. And now I want to you know, find some enrichment for some annotations for some characteristics that tells me what of all those clusters is the one that is more interesting for the disease, prostate cancer. And so those annotations can be, for instance, those. So this is, again, the same clustering as before. It's just colored based on the enrichment or specific annotation. So as I said before, CTCF is an important protein for looping. And as you can see, like the binding of this protein in those contacts is enriched in specific clusters, like cluster 8, cluster 7, cluster 3, and cluster 4. This is like giving some kind of biological meaning to, the, to those uh, contacts that we are retrieving. But then we also enriched for mutations. So mutations that are associated to prostate cancer. And we find that specifically cluster 8 not only is enriched in this important protein in, in, in looping of the chromatin, but a lot of mutations falls there. So by reconstructing those networks in a way, we are like finding clusters that are really meaningful for prostate cancer because there is one, for instance, that is really enriched in these uh, mutations. And this is something that you can see also from this, uh, from this table here. You can see that cluster number eight is significantly uh, enriched in uh, CTCF binding, is significantly enriched in uh, those uh, genome-wide association studies, which means uh, mutations associated to prostate cancer. And the number of genes that are uh, uh, found, the number of promoters that are found in, 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 those, uh, in this cluster number eight is uh, 273. And, uh, and very interestingly, those are promoters of uh, oncogenes, which are known to be involved and dysregulated in prostate cancer, like MIC, uh, GATA2, and so on and so forth. So, OK, you can do this, <laughs> like building those networks uh, all the time if you have someone that knows something about the system under study. Like in the case of prostate cancer, this is a collaboration with the Dana Farber Institute and, uh, and uh, the Italian Institute of Technology. And this is really rule based and, you know, based on, uh, you know, some expert that is telling us how to proceed. But what if we want to, let's say, have a more unbiased way of uh, building graphs and having like a graph representation of the data. So this is where uh, the case of our studies in a single cell transcriptomic and in particular a data set about uh, COVID-19. So what I mean by uh, unbiased representation of, uh, of, uh, of the data. So single cell in general is uh, uh, you know, a series, uh, it's an experiment basically which uh, that allows you to isolate cells uh, identifying them and then uh, having basically the uh, level of expression of all the genes in each one of those cells that you uh, that you recovered. So uh, you end up with a very big matrix uh, that is uh, um, Something that is done uh, very often is to reduce the dimensionality uh, uh, using techniques like UMAP and TISNI, and then uh, like derive some insights uh, from uh, this, uh, uh, this visualization. Now, this practice has been heavily criticized. For instance, there is this paper from last year from Lyre Patcher that uh, even like, you know, called this way of visualizing single cell data a specious art. So just for the sake of being, you know, nice and, uh, and but not really insightful. And because what is the problem? 
The problem is that, as you know more than me, when you when you project like a multidimensional uh, data into a lower dimensional data, you have this projection loss issue. So essentially, you cannot trust anymore the distances uh, between the points that you are seeing in the lower dimensional space, and you cannot really like tell if those different how those differences relates to the original uh, uh, to the original space. In particular, the global distances, because for some techniques you can still trust the local distances, but not really the global ones. So there has been like a lot of work around this uh, this issue recently, and many um, uh, you know tools and libraries that allows you to uh, have a more let's say reliable visualization in a lower dimensional space of uh, single cell data. So here you can see the case uh, of different. Uh, of those approaches, we have TISNA, LargeVis, UMAP, TRIMAP, and PACMAP, and uh, applied to a database that is basically like a visualization of a, of a mammoth. And, uh, and as you can see, like uh, with the different uh, parameters, but the case of PACMAP, from which the study comes, uh, comes from, uh, by the way, in which you, they use the fold parameters, um, essentially, you can see that the, the, the visualization in the case of PACMAC, at least, is a bit more conserved, like it conserved the relationship, the spatial relationship that you can somehow see in the three-dimensional original, original data, something that you cannot really see, like, you know, using different types of, uh, uh, of dimensionality reduction uh, uh, approaches. So this is okay, but what if we don't want just to visualize the data, but with what if what if we want like a representation that is also actionable that we somehow use in uh, in order to you know get some insight in order to compute things and this is where we started uh, um, analyzing like we started exploring topological data analysis applied to single cell data to go beyond the visualization and have a more let's say usable representation so in particular, we uh, apply the mapper algorithm. So the mapper algorithm is uh, uh, an algorithm that works in this way. So imagine that you have your multidimensional uh, um, clouds of points that in this particular picture is represented as bidimensional for simplicity. So the first thing that you want to do is to uh, map this data into a lower dimensional space choosing a specific filter function, which is called also a LEN. Um, those lenses are uh, can be UMAP, TISNE, PCA, any kind of uh, dimensionality reduction approach that you that you want to apply. Then what you want to do is to find an interval uh, with a certain degree of overlaps that allows you that is called like a cover that allows you to cluster the points within. So essentially, you have to define this uh, this cover with a specific percentage of overlap. Uh, in, in, in like in the space of your of, of your data and uh, and then you want to cluster inside each one of those uh, uh, covers and based on the on the common uh, uh, let's say elements that you that you are going to to find between the different uh, uh, those different intervals you can draw an edge so essentially like the network representation that you have at the end is a cluster of points that share some commonalities with another cluster of points. Now, why this is useful? Because essentially, like if you take something that is distant, like for instance, this cluster of data points here in red, and this, this uh, cluster of data points in blue here, you can actually see that they are distant and you can believe this, but you can actually like even measure, like you can even measure, for instance, the number of steps that takes to go from one place to the other. So. In my opinion, this is something like very powerful, especially for single cell, and that allows you to go beyond the simple uh, visualization, uh, even considering like all those issues of projection loss that I was mentioning before. So we apply this um, mapper algorithm to a database of uh, bronchoalveolar immune cells um, uh, in, found in patients with COVID-19. So uh, those are the patients. So we have uh, three healthy individuals, three mild individuals, and uh, um, uh, six severe individuals. And here you have like all the cells that have been uh, identified and the, the counts of, of those cells. Now, from the counts, you cannot really tell much. Actually, it's quite noisy because you can, uh, it's quite like misleading because for instance, you have a lot of microphages 
in the controls and you have a lot of macrophages in the severe cases. You have a lot of T cells in the mild cases and you have a lot of T cells in some severe cases. So, I mean, from the cell counts itself, you cannot really distinguish between those uh, different phenotypes. But what we did was to apply this mapper algorithm in order to have representations like this. Um, so essentially, as you can see, we have the network representations of uh, two patients. In this case, one is a healthy individual and the other one is the, uh, uh, a severe patient. And as you can see, like even from, from just this visualization that the topology of the resulting uh, um, uh, graphs is completely different. There are a different number of nodes and there are a different, number, a different types of colors. So let's talk about the colors. So the colors indicates the composition of those clusters of data points that I was uh, mentioning before. In our case, those clusters of data points are clusters of cells. So for instance, this point here is actually composed of a certain percentages of T cells and then other cells in lower percentages. So none of those, very few of those, uh, um, of those nodes are actually super pure in terms of uh, composition of cells. And this is extremely interesting because it means that regardless of the labels, there are similarities in terms of gene expression between different cells that can be somehow recovered by this, uh, uh, by this approach. Of course, as you can see, like up here, um, like this is one particular case. So as, as I said, we can choose different lenses, we can choose different percentages, different clustering algorithm. This is just one example. So what we are doing now is like to explore this space uh, in order to have like this kind of representations. And in particular, what we are doing is try to find a way of comparing different, uh, those graphs, considering that those graphs are very different one from another in terms of uh, topology, but also in terms of node composition. One, let's say, simple way that we that we found was to essentially like consider um, to like cluster together, try, trying to cluster together those different clusters of cells, define those clusters of clusters as uh, classes using a threshold of noise, let's say. So as we saw before, we have different percentages of other cells that might be present uh, inside there. And so what we do is to like try to uh, cluster together, like find those you know groups of cells um, uh, by screening different levels of uh, noise or if you want of uh, tolerance no of uh, of those uh, of the on the composition of those uh, of those cells. Um, now of course once we have like this relation, we can find the, the optimal the optimal value that is able to recapitulate uh, the three phenotypes. So, uh, Davide? Yes. So, so Arthur has a question, and therefore I just. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. I mean, may Arthur can, can and ask yeah, directly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, didn't, didn't mean to, to break your flow. <laughs> no, no, absolutely, absolutely. No, no. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering if you were comparing here a, uh, I think you mentioned a severe and uh, case, yeah. and how it was, was the other one? Mild, uh, LT, yes. Okay, so it was a mild. Uh, severe and control is healthy. Yes. Okay. And how do you define severe? So this is based on uh, from this paper. So the database is not uh, uh, is not ours. It's from this. Okay. Uh, how, did they, how did they define severe? I, I think it's based. If I remember well, it's based on the on the symptoms. Uh, so I don't remember if they did some kind of respiratory test or something like this. But it's based on symptoms. Of, of COVID. Understood. Uh, so it does not necessarily have separation on ho between hospitalized and non-hospitalized. Uh, I don't remember. It could be. It could be. Uh, but there are some clinical there are some clinical variables that are associated to each one of those uh, patients, and uh, and those indicates if they are uh, you know severe mild controls. Anyways, those are decided by clinicians. I see. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. So um, yeah, the important thing about the labels is that they are not like defined based on on the on the cells. No, you know, like that is not uh, tautological in a way. You no, know? like they should be like based on uh, on a different set of variables so that we are sure that the we can assess if the information from the single cell is actually you know predictive of 
of those classes. This is, I think, it's uh, it's it's important. But as far as I remember, it's uh, it's just based on uh, on those clinical tests, or maybe the hospitalization could be. Uh, but I, I I have to check. Um, Okay, so by uh, by you know allowing a certain uh, levels of uh, of tolerance, no, of those other uh, cells that might uh, uh, be present in those clusters of clusters, we can find like what is the optimal threshold that is able to recapitulate well to cluster well those three classes, no, healthy, mild, and severe, and uh, and here are the results. So essentially, like those are the curves that I was uh, not showing you before, but these times. This time it's like the, the different uh, um, lenses that we used. So of course we we computed all the possible configuration using different lenses, and as you can see, the differences are, are quite are quite striking because there are some lenses like Disney that is giving uh, more noisy classes in general. So you see that uh, the type of classes, the type of clusters of those cells are always higher compared to the to the other. PCA is behaving a bit better. Uh, this uh, line here is like what would be optimal because the optimal situation is uh, when you have a cluster that has only T cell, another cluster that has only B cell. And so, like, if I remember well, like there are 20 cell types. So, like, this line is kind of the, the ideal uh, scenario, which uh, cannot, be, cannot be achieved because there, are, there is this noise inherent in data sets. So, the maximum that we can that we can hope is that we are getting closer and closer to to this uh, let's say pure scenario. So um, uh, PCA seems to be the one that is actually giving uh, a good uh, clustering. So in particular, uh, at a threshold of four, PCA is the one. That, I don't know if it's visible, but it's the one that you can see that here are all the severe cases, here are the controls, and here are the mild. Then you can see like that at other threshold they clusters in different ways. So this particular configuration, and we tried all of them. Um, this particular configuration recapitulate well the this clinical classification. So essentially, the next step, and we are working on this, is to find like enrichments. Like what what are those classes of cells that are discriminating so well? using uh, uh, PCA to build this network representation with this specific threshold. So what are those cells? And we identified that uh, specifically um, epithelial cell monocytes and uh, dend dendritic cells are the ones that seems to be uh, more interesting uh, for the characterization of, uh, of those three phenotypes. Um, OK, so. Um, until now, I show you like a simple way of building graph based on expert uh, knowledge. Uh, one way that is based on topology, but those are always like single graphs. So at the end of the day, we obtain like one monolayer graph. But what if we want to use like multiple graphs, like to to you know interconnect and integrate different uh, graphs? So in order to show you like what we generally do in this kind of uh, uh, situations. Uh, I will talk about rare diseases, which uh, are, for instance, pediatric cancers, and in general, diseases that has a very uh, low incidence in the population. And, and this is because this kind of uh, approaches, when you integrate uh, heterogeneous sources of information, are very useful in these uh, scenarios. So the type of um, um, framework that we use when we want to integrate uh, uh, different types of data is called multilayer networks. So a multilayer network is basically a network of networks, and uh, each network is called a layer, and each layer represents different aspects of the system that you are studying. For instance, if you are studying a biological system, like one layer can be gene co-expression, another layer can be based on gene methylation, and so on and so forth. So each layer is uh, has different nodes connected to edges, which are called intra-layer edges. But the, the characteristic is that uh, also uh, among the different layers, the nodes can be connected. And in this case, those are called interlayer edges. The way in which you construct those connections can be as you want. So it really depends on the, on the type of uh, you know, hypothesis and on the type of representation that you want to achieve with, with this multilayer network. The easiest way is to connect uh, them if they represent exactly the same entity. For instance, if this node here is one gene and this guy here is exactly the same gene, 
you can connect the two of them. And you can do the same for all the other nodes and you end up with an object like this. And as you can see, this is really nice for integrating the uh, heterogeneous sources of information because for instance, this node down here, it doesn't have any correspondence in the, in the other nodes, in the other layers, but still this can be connected to the other layers, to the other biological aspects that you are studying through its neighbor. So it's a really, you know, interesting approach for integrating data. And uh, well, this is the way in which you formalize this. It's essentially, well, I mean, a quadruplet in which you have, you know, the set of nodes, the set of layers, a matrix uh, with the, the nodes that dwells in which layers, and then like another matrix with uh, the, the, the pairs of nodes and layers, uh, how they are connected uh, uh, together, which are basically like, you know, those, the dashed lines here. Um, so more interesting than that is like, how do you build those multi-layer networks? Like if you, if you would to start from scratch, where to start? So there are two options. So if you have data in, in your lab, for instance, uh, uh, like uh, multi-omics data, so matrices of expression, matrices of methylation and things like this, something that you want to do is to convert those matrices into network representation. And this step is called network inference. It's a very critical step. It can be done in a thousand way. And it's generally very difficult because you need like a lot of data in order to be sure that this network representation is really like a good representation of, uh, of your data. But imagine that you, you can do that. You can convert your, uh, you can infer a network representation from your multi-omics information. Then you can stack together those graphs and then you can apply some kind of multi-layer network analysis. Now, in order to make this network inference, there are many approaches. One, for instance, is called COSIFER. This is uh, produced by, has been, um, um, yes, developed by IBM, is open source. And uh, this is basically based on uh, finding a consensus among different uh, um, similarity metrics uh, and different approaches for uh, network inference. So it's looking for consensus in order to represent, for instance, an expression data matrix into a, a layer. But there are many other different approaches. Honestly speaking, I prefer the second approach to create a multi-layer network, which is based on using external databases. And I prefer this because I work with rare diseases. And so what I want to do is to take the little information that I have of the, my rare diseases and put them into a bigger context. And this bigger context can come from external databases, which contain all the accumulated knowledge of biomedicine that we have until now. And the good thing is that those databases generally present this information in, in a relational way. So it's very straightforward to, for instance, go to string and essentially like download the graph representation of protein protein interactions. Once you have this information, once you select the information that you that you are more interested in too, you can again stack everything together, connect uh, the, 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 the edges and then apply some kind of network, multi-layer network analysis. Now, what we mean when we say, uh, okay, <laughs> sorry, I, I was forgotten about this uh, this slide. So basically, we have those we have those layers that comes from databases, and and this is structured information. But of course, you can always have a layer that comes from unstructured information. So, for instance, if you want to build one of the layer of the multi-layer networks using, uh, uh, for instance, the abstract of uh, publications. Uh, you can use text mining and uh, uh, and you can, uh, uh, with word embeddings or other approaches, create a network representation of the knowledge that has been extracted from uh, uh, from those texts. And this is, for instance, the case of hepatoblastoma. This is a can pediatric liver cancer. Uh, we selected the, the abstract uh, uh, indexed for hepatoblastoma. We uh, extracted the different bio entities. And then uh, by analyzing the semantic context of those words, we could uh, represent this information into the form of a network. So this is just another way of uh, having a network representation of information and then use this information inside a multi-layer network. So uh, when I say um, that you can perform some kind of multi-layer multi network analysis on top of this multi-layer network, like what I, what I meant was, for instance, uh, something like this. Um, community detection. This is something that is generally done uh, in uh, networks in general. 
So uh, a community is a region of a network that has a higher um, density of connections between the nodes. And specifically in the case of a multi-layer network, this is found by maximizing uh, the sum of um, a, a, a quality math measure that is called modularity. Uh, the modularity is basically measuring this uh, uh, density of interconnectivity uh, in a specific uh, partition C of the layer G of the multi-layer X, okay? So what we want to do is to maximize this property here, which mainly essentially means that you want to find the region of the multi-layer network that has at the same time the higher modularity in, in, the, in all the, uh, uh, the, the layers. Now, as you can see, this modularity is... Uh, parameterized by something that is called the resolution. This is called gamma, that is the resolution. And this resolution um, governs the size of the community. And the, the relationship between uh, the, the, the community size and the number of community that you are discovering by increasing, for instance, the resolution parameter is this one, which essentially means that if you start with a resolution of zero, the entire multi-layer network is going to be considered as a big community. Then if you increase the modularity resolution, you are going to find more communities and then more communities. You increase the resolution, you find more communities. Now, none of those, like there is not, like all those communities are all valid. There is not one that is, you know, better than the other. Those are all coexisting inside this multi-layer network. But something that we observe that is very important is that some nodes tend to stay together all the time in the same communities regardless of the value of resolution. And considering that those communities comes from a multi-layer network that is collecting you know, different evidences uh, for, um, from different databases, from different uh, biological aspects, the, the fact that they are always together, it's like a sign of a very strong functional relatedness between them. And so we wanted to you know, exploit this property and compute for each node what is its trajectory throughout all those communities while increasing the uh, resolution uh, parameter. And so we uh, published last year this, uh, uh, this approach. Essentially, we have uh, a range of modularity resolution that we are exploring, and we are identifying the different uh, uh, community structures. The first step is to label all those communities that we identified, and then for uh, pairwise comparison uh, among the different nodes, we can compute distances and represent those distances uh, in uh, like, like a, a dendrogram, uh, which is very like, you know, is very informative because for instance, uh, I don't know, like those two, G2 and G3, they stayed always together until the end, uh, while this G1 escaped at a certain point, like up here, he escaped and we can see this uh, in, the, in the picture. Now, if you take a real, a real multi-layer network, and of course, like this kind of dendrograms are much bigger, and, and, but they are also much more informative. And once you have an object like this, you can study, for instance, uh, things like uh, how distance are the different communities in the tree, how the composition of the different communities uh, uh, is, especially if you have specific genes that, uh, uh, that are interesting for, uh, for you, for your study. So we apply this to the case of medulloblastoma, which is a childhood brain tumor. And uh, without entering into the details, essentially the medulloblastoma patients can be um, divided into four subtypes, which are called uh, WNT, SHH, group three, and group four. And essentially this classification is a molecular classification. So you can take uh, protogenomic data, multiomics data, and you can identify which are the genes that are actually classifying those uh, patients into those established four subgroups. Now, if you have multiomics information and you say that uh, like uh, those different genes might, might have some kind of alteration, might, 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 have, like, might be different, let's say, the ones in, uh, in the group SSH with respect to the others, you will end up with a lot of genes. And this is because this uh, rare disease is very heterogeneous. So those 14,000 genes that you are retrieving, they are able to classify the four subtypes, but they are 14,000. So it's like a lot of genes and this is of any uh, use for a clinician. So in this project, what we did was to try to reduce this number, try to find the minimal set of genes that are able to recapitulate um, these four uh, patient uh, um, uh, stratification. 
And so, first of all, we um, uh, create a multi-layer network from external database that represent different uh, uh, aspects like pathway uh, pathways, uh, probably interactions, and so on. Uh, we we uh, computed all the trajectories and we built our multi-layer network, uh, our uh, dendrogram of trajectories, and then we use this in order to identify what is the minimal number of genes that can recapitulate those four subtypes, achieving a 95% of accuracy and an 85% of dimensionality reduction. So how we did that? It's a, an optimization problem, basically. So we said that we start with this uh, uh, dendrogram and we define two parameters. One is called the distance in the tree, theta, and the other one is the maximum number of altered genes that you allow in a community. So for instance, imagine that we are uh, analyzing uh, a value of uh, what is happening at theta equals one, one and lambda equal two. This means a distance in the tree of one, which is up here. And so up here, we have a situation like this. We have two communities and like two altered genes in one community and three altered genes in another community. What we want to do is to reduce the number of uh, genes to use, okay? So lambda two means that we are only keeping a maximum number of two genes. And this is again, because we want to reduce the number of genes. So if now we use the expression of those genes in order to classify those patients, what is the accuracy? What is the accuracy of this theta equals one and lambda equals two? Okay, we can do this for all the possible combinations of theta and lambda, and we can discover that the best um, uh, the, the best pair of parameters is up here. Uh, theta equals zero and lambda equals six. Okay, we perform all, all sort of uh, robustness analysis in order to uh, to see if this makes sense. So we shuffle the labels, and we see that when we shuffle the labels, the performances are actually random. Uh, we also um, perform some kind of sensitivity analysis like this uh, sequential exclusion test in which essentially like those uh, 1000 genes that we identified, um, we take them and we remove from the original data set and then we start again the entire process of optimization. And then we remove again the ones that we found and so on. And so you can see that uh, the performances are going down, are going down and that the optimization algorithm is trying to all the time adapt to the, to the optimal values no, that, that will be specific of each, of each uh, step. But this is also telling us that the ones that we remove at the beginning are the ones that, they, that are giving the, the highest performances. So we really trust them, let's say. Uh, this is just a representation of the clusters of those patients. So once we find those minimal set of genes, like when we use them to classify the patients, we can nicely reconstruct the different uh, four subtypes. And we also like discovered a new subtypes, which is very interesting. Uh, apparently, like those uh, patients uh, have some similarities among them. And in the paper, there are uh, the, the, the explanations why it's, uh, it's like that. But then the most important thing about all this, uh, this approach is that remember that all this is computed starting from a multilayer network. So once you identify this group of genes, you can always go back to the multilayer network and see what those genes were doing in each one of the layers. So for instance, here you can see, you can compute like enrichments of those genes in the pathway layer. And so you have the different, uh, the different uh, uh, groups uh, that we identified and uh, some pathways that are enriched, uh, which are also corroborated by uh, the literature. And you can do this exercise for any of the, uh, of the, uh, of the layers that compose the multilayer network. So this is really like, you know, going into the direction of uh, explainability if you want, because you find something and then you can like uh, really explain why it is like that and be providing some uh, details uh, that are specific of the different layers. Uh, we apply this approach to other rare diseases. This is another one, it's called the congenital myasthenic syndrome. It's exactly the same. We apply the same approach and we identify the communities that are specific characteristics of uh, severe and non-severe cases. And uh, uh, the interesting thing about this work is that we we spot some uh, uh, candidate genes that are mutated in this disease. And this has been uh, actually uh, validated uh, using an experimental model, uh, specifically zebrafish. So if we knock down those genes, we can see that there is a reduction, for instance, in the uh, characteristics of the muscle of, uh, of this animal. And, and so, and this is interesting because those candidates they were not being associated to this kind of muscle problems before. So through this method, essentially, we could uh, really spot some interesting uh, cases. 
Okay, then the, the final the final uh, part is about, uh, okay, now that we have all those graphs, now we can maybe learn from those graphs. And this is exactly what we did using uh, uh, graphs that represent mobility uh, and uh, incidents in COVID-19. So uh, this is data that was published by us uh, in uh, 2021. It's about uh, mobility and incidents in uh, Spain uh, from the beginning of the pandemic until uh, until a certain point uh, in 2021, I don't remember exactly the months, but it's it's really like uh, the entire, it's like one year and more uh, of everything that happened in Spain in terms of mobility and in terms of uh, incidents. And this is really nice because you, I mean, there is an API that you can use in order to access the, the data that is open. And also there is a dashboard that allows you to, to perform some analysis and to visualize this, uh, this information, mobility and incidents. So we use, I mean, in, in recent years, we use this data in order to, to perform any different types of studies, from assessing the impact of uh, public health policies uh, to perform retrospective analysis. The type of uh, study that I want to talk about uh, uh, today here is uh, uh, about uh, using graph embeddings in order to study the relationship between uh, mobility and incidence. So we use this data uh, that uh, the database is called Flow Maps. We represent this as, as networks and we compute uh, uh, embeddings. Uh, we optimize the, the data, especially in terms of the incidence, uh, normalization between the different uh, um, um, different autonomous communities of Spain. We have to like really take care of, of this part of the, of the data, how it's presented. And then we train a neural network with these uh, mobility uh, graph embeddings in order to predict the, uh, the incidence 15 days uh, after. So, uh, well, this is the part about, uh, you know, how every day uh, we have this kind of, uh, of networks. So the nodes are different uh, provinces and they are connected uh, uh, if there is, uh, you know, moving people from, uh, from one place to the other. And, uh, and each node is characterized by uh, features that is the incidence 15 days after. So we have, you know, like uh, the mobility in one day and then we have the incident, we want to predict the incidents 15 days after. So, um, okay, we use not to back in order to, uh, to create those, uh, those embeddings. This is based on random works, it's very, uh, it's very commonly used. And then there are uh, like approaches in order to optimize those embeddings in order to guarantee that those embeddings are actually like good representation of the original, of the original data. And once we have these uh, optimal uh, node embeddings, uh, what we can do is to, as I said, train a neural network. The, here are the parameters and also the evaluations that, uh, that, we, that we followed. And then uh, in order to make this prediction. And the results are basically this. So we divided this uh, year and a half in uh, uh, three, uh, um, uh, three blocks of months. And as you can see, essentially like mobility is really good at predicting incidents at the beginning of the pandemic. And this is something that was actually already known. Like if you look in the, in the literature, this is something that you can, uh, that has been already like uh, mentioned in publications, which makes sense because what happens is that at the beginning of the pandemic, like mobility was the, the main way in which people were transmitting the, the disease. So there was this very strong relationship between mobility and incidents. But then throughout the, the months, like all sorts of uh, um, measures have been implemented. And so like mobility is not the only, uh, let's say, uh, element anymore. So of course it's ability to predict incidents goes down the more we go through the, uh, the pandemic, okay? But the interesting thing about, uh, about this study is that you can also like uh, analyze the situation by autonomous community and see, for instance, in which places like the mobility is a better uh, predictor of incidents. For instance, in Andalusia and in Galicia, you see that we could achieve very high uh, accuracies only using mobility. Uh, so this is interesting because then we can like, for instance, go back in time and see uh, what was going on in Andalusia and in Galicia and where the policies failed, for instance, in those, uh, in those places. Um, okay, so to conclude, I gave a bit of a overview of all the different things that you can do in network medicine with, uh, with networks, like uh, if they are, you know, 
created based on uh, expert-driven uh, uh, approaches or topology-based approaches if you want to put them uh, together so you can like call them multi-layer networks and uh, uh, perform some kind of analysis like community detection and then uh, if you want like to use those representations in order to learn something to create models for making predictions uh, so with this i thank you thank you all for the attention and uh, and all the, uh, the the collaborators of all those works if you have any uh, further question i will happy to reply thank you so much thank you very much davida for this uh, very interesting and, and, and exciting talk uh